This conference will now be recorded. Hello. Welcome to FISH 507, Applied Time Series Analysis, offered at the University of Washington. Today is the second lecture in our series, and we'll be discussing stationarity and some introductory time series functions. In general, there are a number of topics we have to cover before we can move on to the more complicated things, and time series analysis is no different. So we'll begin our discussion today talking about mean and variance, and then move on to things like covariance and correlation, and how that relates to stationarity. We'll then discuss autocovariance and autocorrelation and correlograms, a means for displaying a correlation function. Then we'll move into some models for time series, particularly white noise and random walk, and we'll end by talking about two important operators in time series, the backshift and difference operators. Beginning with the mean, we can think of the expectation or E of a variable is its mean value in the population. So we write this as E of X and we define that to be the mean of X and we often use the symbol mu to represent that. We can estimate mu from a sample as very simply the sum of all of our observations divided by the number of observations. The variance is the expectation of the deviations of x about the mean value. And again, we define this e of x minus mu squared, I should say deviation squared, to be the variance of x, and we use often the symbol sigma squared to mean variance. We can estimate the variance from the sample as the sum of those squared deviations over all n divided by n minus one, and we lose one degree of freedom here for having to estimate this. If we have two variables, x and y, we can generalize the variance, which is the squared difference between the observations and the mean, into covariance. And so this is the difference in the x, from its mean times the difference in the y times its mean. So this is now the covariance of x and y rather than the variance of x or the variance of y. We can estimate the covariance of x and y from a sample similarly the way we would a variance term. But now rather than squaring just one of these, we're gonna multiply the deviations of the x minus their mean and the deviations of the y minus their mean and again, we're having to pay a price here, so we have one minus, or n minus one degrees of freedom, so we're dividing by n minus one. Here's a graphical example of covariance. Here's two variables, x and y, plotted together. And the first thing we do is think of this as dividing this up into four quadrants, delineated by the mean of x here, at about six, and the mean of y here at perhaps about 2.5. So anything to the left over here are going to be values where the observations are less than the mean of x, and over here the values are greater than the mean of x, and up here the values are greater than the mean of y, and down here they're less than the mean of y. So if you think about multiplying each of these together, because remember we have to take the x minus its mean, multiplied by y minus its mean. So here we have a negative value times positive. So these are negative. Here we have positive values times positive values. These are all positive. Here's a negative value times a positive value. So these are negative. And here's negative times negative. So these are positive. So if we sum up the number of positives and the number of negatives, we have way more positives than we do negatives. So the covariance between x and y is positive. Correlation is a dimensionless measure of the linear association between two variables, x and y. And it's really just the covariance standardized by the standard deviations of x and y. And we typically denote the co correlation by rho. So here we have rho of x, y equals the covariance in x and y divided by the standard deviation of x divided by the standard deviation of y. And the nice thing about standardizing here is this constrains our correlation to be between minus one and one. We can estimate the correlation from a sample 
by taking the estimated covariance and dividing that by our estimated standard deviation of x and our standard deviation of y. Stationarity and the mean. Consider a single value for a moment x of t. You may recall from last lecture that the expectation for that x of t is taken across an ensemble of all possible time series. So here you could imagine these gray lines representing the all possible time series, and the expectation of each of those at time t in this case is zero, denoted by those blue dashes. But in reality, we just have one single estimate, one single realization. So this single realization becomes our estimate of the value itself. This conference will now be recorded. If the expectation of xt is constant across time, as it was in that previous example, we say that the time series is stationary in the mean. And stationarity is a nice assumption that allows us to describe the statistical properties of a time series. And in general, a time series is said to be stationary if there is no systematic change in the mean or the variance, so we don't have step changes. In our data, we don't have the data exploding as though they did in that random walk example from last time. There's no systematic trend, so there's no increase or decrease overall, or there's no quadratic trend, and there are no periodic variations or seasonality. So, by way of example, here are four time series, and if asked to identify whether or not these are stationary, we'd have to pause and think about this for a moment. We might say that perhaps this one in the upper left and this one in the lower right look like, yes, there's no real change in the mean or the variance and it doesn't look like there's a problem, but perhaps this one in the lower left or perhaps this one in the upper right are not stationary. They look a little odd, so to speak. Well, it turns out that all four of these are in fact realizations of stationary time series models and I simulated them, so I know that to be the case. So just like in other fields of statistics, our eyes are terrible at identifying stationarity. So we're gonna need some tools to help us do this, and we'll proceed to learn more about those today and next time. The First thing we're gonna talk about is for a stationary time series, we're gonna define the auto covariance function, gamma sub k, as the expectation of the difference between our value x of t minus its mu times a shifted version of that x minus the mu. And here the k is the number of time steps we're going to shift, indicated here. Which means that, of course, if k equals zero, then here we're left with x of t, here we're left with x of t, and this is simply just the variance. So the auto covariance at lag zero is in fact the variance. As we move this time lag forward or backwards, however, we will not necessarily get the variance. It's perhaps possible we might get the same estimate, but almost certainly not. Smooth time series have large auto covariance functions for large k, and choppy time series have auto covariance functions near zero for small k. So smooth series might be something like a random walk that we saw last time, and choppy might be something like white noise, which we also saw last time. We can estimate the auto covariance function from a sample, very similarly to we would with the variance, but here, so here's our x of t minus the mean, and now we have a time shifted version of x of t minus the mean. And that means when we do this summation, we can only do this over n minus k values because as we shift our time series here, we're losing values off the beginning and the end of the time series. And then we can divide that by n. The autocorrelation function or ACF is simply that autocovariance function normalized by the variance. So this is similar to how we took the correlation and normal or covariance rather and normalize it to get the correlation we can take the auto covariance and normalize it to get the auto correlation and so that is simply the auto covariance normalized by the variance 
which is the same as the auto covariance at some lag k divided by the auto covariance at lag zero. And the autocorrelation function measures the correlation of a time series against a time shifted version of itself, which we can estimate from a sample as the auto estimated auto covariance divided by that auto covariance at lag zero or the estimated variance. The properties of the ACF are many, but some of which will be very important to us and useful. Just as with other measures of correlation, this value of the autocorrelation function ranges between minus one and one. It also turns out that the autocorrelation at a positive lag equals the autocorrelation at a negative lag. It's a so-called even function. So it doesn't matter which way we shift the time series, we should get the same autocorrelation. The autocorrelation function of a periodic function is itself periodic, and we'll see that in just a moment. The autocorrelation for the sum of two independent variables is the sum of the autocorrelation for each of them. So if we had two independent variables, x and y, we could compute the autocorrelation for x, the autocorrelation for y, add those, and we would get the autocorrelation for the sum of x plus y. The common means for displaying information from uh, the autocorrelation function is the correlogram. And the correlogram is a plot of the lag k versus the estimated autocorrelation function, which again ranges between 1 and minus 1. And the standard output from the R software is to have a bar at lag 0 that equals 1. So this is the correlation at lag zero equals to one, which makes sense because this is simply the correlation of a time series with itself, which is one. It's shown on the autocorrelation function plot simply as a means for visual reference. So it serves as a relative marker here as though you might be unable to read the scale bar itself. Second aspect of a correlogram that you'll see in typical R plots are approximate confidence intervals. So here we have plus or minus some standard z-score at a 1 minus alpha over 2 value divided by the square root of n. And a couple of things I'd like to point out. The first is that this alpha value in R is not uh, corrected for multiple tests. So you might be checking at each one of these 15 lags. You might say, well, that constitutes 15 independent tests. I should perhaps adjust the critical value of alpha. Second of all, as we mentioned before, as you shift the, ver the time series against itself, you're going to run into a situation where at each, as you increase the lags, the number of data points that you have to estimate the correlation is going down. So this n is decreasing, which means overall this confidence interval should increase for the same number of alpha. So in fact, these confidence intervals should be an increasing cone where they should be wider here than they are down here, but R does not do that for you. I think it's informative to examine the autocorrelation function for some deterministic functions, which will help you moving forward to identify some things in the underlying structure of the data. So here is a simple linear trend. This is just a time series that goes from one to 100. So it's a straight line. The autocorrelation function is 1 at lag 0, and it's very high at lag 1, 2, 3, even well out to lag 20, it still has significant autocorrelation with one another, which makes sense. It's a straight line. So here, 1, one is related to 2, is related to 3, related to 4, etc. Here's the autocorrelation function for a discrete or monthly, you could think of, sine wave. So this is a discrete, has 12, a period of 12 discrete values that are repeated every year. So here it is. And as I mentioned before, the autocorrelation function of a discrete function is itself periodic. So here we have this overall periodic shape, where in particular, we see strong, auto cor strong positive correlation one year from one another. So that's these peaks are correlated with the peaks. And we see strong negative co correlation at minus or six a lag of six, I'm sorry, so minus correlation because this peak 
six years later or six time points later is this trough. The ACF for a linear trend plus seasonal effect. So here's a decreasing linear trend with a sort of regular sine wave mapped on top of it is a damped period itself. So here you see an overall decrease in the tops of these, which will taper off as we move through time. And here's this overall sinusoidal pattern. Here's a sequence of 10 random numbers repeated 10 times. So this is simply 10 random numbers stuck together, repeated all over itself. Here's the autocorrelation function for that. You get significant lags at 10 and 20, which makes sense because those are the peaks or the troughs lining up with each other. And then it just so happened that there was another one that jumped in here. So you're getting some other positive lags. If you think about a correlation, we have some induced autocorrelation we can think of in a time series. And the way to think about that is if you remember way back to early mathematics and the transitive property, which states that if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals to C. Well, this would suggest that if X is proportional to Y and Y is proportional to Z, then perhaps X is proportional to Z. And thus, similarly, if X is proportional to a one-step shifted version of itself, and T plus one is proportional to T plus two, then probably X at T is proportional to T plus two. And so this motivates what we think of as partial autocorrelation function. The partial autocorrelation function measures the correlation between a series X of T and a time-shifted version of itself with the linear dependence of the intervening values removed. So here we're talking x at t to x at t plus k. So if we took away the effect of x at t all the way up to x at t minus k minus 1, what would be the linear relation? So remember, we think x is proportional to this. These two are proportional. These are proportional, et cetera, down the road. So we want to remove that intermediate correlation and examine what's left over. We can estimate this from a sample as follows. If the lag is one, then we simply have the autocorrelation function at lag one, because there is no way to remove any more intervening noise. We have x at t and x at t plus one. As soon as the lag is two or greater, however, we can estimate two values, this value here, x sub k, and x sub zero with the k minus one superscripts. And what these are is linear, the results of a linear regression on those intervening values. We have two equations jointly where we have the same regression con, uh, coefficients appearing in each one, but in each case, the coefficients are different. So here we start at the back and move forward. And here we start at the beginning and move to the back. So we have an estimate of each of those. You would subtract that out, similar to the way we would do something like a mean in a covariance example, and then examine the remaining correlation once these two intervening effects were removed. So here's the example of some data from Lake Washington. This is the log biomass of Cryptomonas plotted from the mid-1970s to the mid-1980s. What you see is a sort of an increase over time and then a leveling off here. Here is the autocorrelation function for those data. And there's a couple of points I'd like to make here. First of all, R has a time series object, which we'll explore in the lab portion of the course, which allows you to assign true values to things like dates and whatnot, and it will keep track of those. When you do that for values that have a monthly period, so a period of 12, it somehow thinks you're talking about years with respect to lag. So here we have a lag of one, which is one year, but is actually 12 months. And so in those phytoplankton data, what you see is that there's correlation in one at lag zero, which we expect, and then there's high autocorrelation, one time step down the road, two, again, five to six months later, 
and again 11, 12, 13 months later. So this suggests that if it's high in July, it's going to be high in August and somewhat high in September, et cetera. Here's the partial autocorrelation function for that, those same data where we've now removed all of that intermediate correlation between those values. And what we see what's left over here is it appears to be some strong relationship at a lag of four months and a lag of 11 months. We are going to see in our next lecture that the autocorrelation function and partial autocorrelation functions will be very useful for identifying the orders of ARMA models. So stay tuned. Often, we'd like to look for the relationship between two different time series, not just the time shifted version of a single time series. So we can extend the notion of covariance to cross covariance. And we can estimate this cross covariance from a sample as such. Here we have the deviation of the x of t minus its mean. And here we have the deviation of not y of t minus its mean, but y of t, where the y now has been shifted a bit. So again, we're losing some values here as we increase this k because we have to knock ends off of each of these time series as we shift them apart from one another. Just as with the correlation, we have the cross correlation function, which is these cross covariance function normalized by the standard deviations of x and y. So here's our cross covariance function. We can divide that by the standard deviation of x and the standard deviation of y, and we get the cross correlation, which as we would expect from other measures of correlation is normalized to be between minus one and one. Here's an example of cross correlation. On the bottom here, lower left, we have the number of trapped links in Canada from 1820 to 1934, which we saw earlier. And here we have sunspot activity over that same time period. And what I plotted here on the right-hand column is the cross correlation between those. And this it can be tricky to interpret because we have negative lags and positive lags. So we're trying to think about which of these is leading and which one of these is trailing. And in the R software, it's a bit tricky because R treats it the exact opposite way I would if we were thinking about this in sort of a cause and effect manner. That is, I would think that here we're thinking of sunspots as sort of potential cause and the response of links as an effect. So I would think of this as an X and a Y. R treats those exactly the opposite. So here, because I'm treating this as an X and this and a Y, it really makes sense to think about the effect of sunspot activity today on links activity today or somewhere down the road. So we're gonna examine then the positive links, or lags here rather. So it looks like about three, four, and five, but in particular, four years after we would have high sunspot activities, we have low links numbers. And similarly, about eight, nine, or 10 years, maybe 11 years after high sunspot activity, we have high links numbers. And if you squint at these plots here, you can sort of see that perhaps the peaks of the links lag the peaks of the sunspots. Now let's explore some simple models for time series analysis. The first one, which will be very important to us moving forward, is white noise. And a time series is discrete white noise if its values are number one, independent, and two, identically distributed with a mean of zero. So this means, as you've probably heard many times before, independent and identically distributed, IID. Here we also add the additional constraint of mean zero. Note that the distributional form for those uh, WT is flexible, however. So here, let's say I had an e, a WT that was described this way. It was equal to two times a variable E sub T minus one, where E sub T is a Bernoulli variable with a probability of one half. So this takes on values zero of one. So this will take on values between one and minus one. 
So here's a realization of that model. It just bounces around between minus one and one. So the expectation over all of these is zero. And here's the autocorrelation function here. One at a lag of zero and non-significant everywhere else. This is a high point of white noise. It has autocorrelation of zero for lags greater than one. One greater than zero, excuse me. We often assume a, a more stringent form of white noise called Gaussian no white noise. And that simply means that our values, WT, are distributed normally with some mean zero and some variance sigma squared. The following also apply to white noise. The auto covariance equals the variance at lag zero, just like it would with any other uh, value. And it equals zero if the lags are greater than or equal to one. And as I mentioned before, as does the autocorrelation. So it's one if the lag is zero, and it's zero if the lags are greater than or equal to one. So here's an example of Gaussian white noise on the left. It's a random variant distributed normally with mean zero and variance one. And here's its autocorrelation function on the right, which has a perfect correlation of one at lag zero. And all of these are not non-significant with the exception of value seven here, which appears to be significant. Now that is a bit perplexing because I just got done telling you that the autocorrelation function for uh, white noise should be zero for all lags equal to one or greater. So what's going on here? Well, we need to understand that when you have a relatively limited sample size, that one in 20, of these null hypothesis tests should be false by chance. So here's one where we seem to have some spurious correlation in the data by chance alone. So this is something to be aware of moving forward when you find some lags that perhaps or significant correlations at particular lags that don't make sense. Just bear in mind that you are doing multiple tests here and perhaps these should be adjusted likewise. Okay, the second model that I'd like to discuss, we saw a little bit example of this in the first lecture, is a random walk model. The time series is a random walk if its value at time t equals its value at time t plus t minus one plus some white noise component. And here again, we're not making any real forms about the, the form of the w's, just knowing that it has to meet the criteria of being white noise. The following apply to random walks. If they have a mean of zero, their autocovariance is a function of time as is their autocorrelation, which means they are in fact not stationary. Here's an example of a random walk where we've got x sub t equals x sub t minus one plus these w and the w are white noise components, which in this case are Gaussian, so they have mean zero and variance one. And random walks tend to have this behavior where there can be a little bit of wiggle, but they tend to have some sort of a wander around through space and they do so relatively smoothly. Similarly, the autocorrelation function from random walks has high autocorrelation out to many lags. Here it's significant out to at least the lags of about 12. And that's typical of random walks. Lastly, I'm going to end with some description of some important operators in time series analysis. The first is the backshift operator, B. We define B to be simply moving the time subscript back one unit. So here's B times X of T is equal to simply X at T minus one. Or more generally, we could say B to the K equals x sub t is going to be equal to x at t minus k. So for example, here's a random walk model where x sub t equals x sub t minus 1 plus w sub t it can be written with the back shift operator using this notation. We take x sub t, we replace the t minus 1 with this back shift operator here. We then move it to this side, pull the x sub t out, and divide that over here. So here we're writing a random walk model where there doesn't appear to be any x sub t on the right-hand side of the equation. 
but through some algebraic steps, we would in fact recover this. Now this is a notation we're not going to rely on heavily in this course, but it is used quite a bit in textbooks and more technical papers, so it's important that you understand what it means. The next operator that will be important to us is the difference operator. And the difference operator we define as simply subtracting the value x sub t minus x sub t minus sub 1. So here we use this gradient operator to say difference in t x sub t equals simply a time shifted version of itself. So for example, if we apply that operator to a random walk, we're going to get white noise. So we say the difference of this means we're going to subtract that x t minus sub 1 here from both sides. So we pull that out over here. These two will cancel out. So the first difference of a random walk is white noise. And if you don't believe me, I suggest you simulate it and try it. The difference operator and the backshift operator are related. So the difference at lag k is equal to the quantity 1 minus backshift operator raised to power k. So for example, if we took the difference of x of t and we multiplied that times x of t over here, we'd multiply out accordingly. So this says simply difference that. So here's now x of t minus x of t x sub t minus 1. And over here, we multiply this through. So here we have x sub t, and now we have back shift times x sub t. And we know that that equals x sub t minus 1. So these two are, in fact, equivalent. Difference is, is a way to remove a trend. So if you take out a first difference, you're going to remove a linear trend. If you did that twice, you could remove a quadratic trend, and if you did it three times, you'd remove a tertiary trend, etc. So here's an example where on the top, we have a time series x sub t, which has a fairly obvious linear trend in it, increasing over time. If we first difference that time series, here we're left with just those deviations around what appeared to be a trend. So these now you could think of as sort of the slope estimates of the instantaneous slope of that. It is the difference from one time step to one another. Differencing is also a way to remove a seasonal effect. So if you use a first difference with the lag k equal to the period of the seasonality, you can remove both the trend and seasonal effect. So here are some temperature data from Lake Washington on the top. And what you see is a fairly obvious seasonal pattern where it's cold in the winter, warm in the summer. And if we take the first difference of those temperature data, we end up with the time series below, which is just those random deviations around that sort of overall periodic effect. So here was some years that were particularly warm, or months rather. Here's some that years and months that were particularly cool. Here's a very cool period followed a relatively warm period. So by way of review, for topics for today, we talked a lot about some of the different statistical properties of, of time series and the way we characterize those, things like mean and variance, covariance and correlation, autocovariance and autocorrelation. We talked about some simple time series models, white noise and rammed walks, and we introduced the backshift and difference operators. And with that, I'll thank you for your time. Goodbye.